Good evening, everyone. Great to be with you this evening from Newcastle Elim Church. Great to see you, or rather, great for you to see us. Always good to be in church with a few more people, and it's revival tonight. I think we're up to nine. <laughs> Everyone's volunteering to be on the team. No, not really. It's great to be here. We're going to have a great night. We, we believe we've solved internet issues, so we should be fine tonight. So wherever you are watching, there's people from all over the place tuning in. Let's worship him. Sing, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. More than I need. At your word I will. your spirit make me new and I will fall at your feet I will fall at your feet and I will worship you here let's sing that again your great it's true. Your grace is enough, more than I need. At your word I will believe. I wait for you. Draw near again. Let your
Thank you, Lord, that wherever we are, we can sing that line, I will worship you here. 
Thank you, Lord, for our freedom to worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. So tonight, we're going to look at the fall of Babylon. So I'm going to read. Thanks, guys. See you after. Thank you, Jesus. I will worship you here. Great. Okay, so I'm going to read. I'm going to turn my guitar off. And I'm going to read um, Revelation 17 now, and then I'll be back later to read chapter 18. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come. I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus." When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven. Are you following this? <laughs> And it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is lord of lords and king of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. I understand that bit. Hallelujah. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are people and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into her hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. You can explain it now. 
<laughs> As uh, I've been saying throughout these studies, guys, into the book of Revelation, um, don't try and work out the symbolism. Um, don't try and look at the detail. Look at the outcome. We're looking at the outcome. This is the end of time. This is the period that, we're, it, that God is about to usher in a new kingdom. Uh, sorry, a new heaven and a new earth. The kingdom's already here. And um, the outcome is certain. You don't, you don't have to uh, really struggle to see the outcome of this. Now, to understand Babylon, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 11. And Babylon is first introduced to us as Babel. If you know that chapter, you know I was going to say Babel there. And I'm going to read that to us now. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. The key to, um, to this and what, why God intervened was it was man in his own strength saying, let us make a name for ourselves. We're going to build something so magnificent. But they were doing it outside of God. And that's important to know. When we look at Revelation and understanding the world system, uh, the world order and the world system, and we've already uh, come across the, uh, the, the Antichrist already in, in the book of Revelation and the end times, and we're gathering pace now. And as we'll see, it's very, very significant. Now, this is the point where we're almost getting where Jesus is on his way to earth. And he's not coming as a meek little baby. He's coming leading the armies of heaven. And he's coming as a warrior to the earth. Not, not, uh, you know, not against us, obviously but against uh, the, the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, that, that terrible um, leadership that will be on earth at the very end. So though Babel failed, that they didn't make a name for themselves because God intervened, in the same spirit, Babylon was eventually built. It was a real city. And in Daniel 4, 28 to 30, it says this, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the 12 months he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is, this, sorry, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? David Pawson says, when it reached its heyday, Babylon uh, was the greatest city in the then known world. And the famous hanging gardens of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the world at that time under King Nebuchadnezzar's rule. In Isaiah 13, 17 to 22, we see the end of that actual Babylon, if you like, that city. This is historical, what I'm saying to you. This happened. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them who will not regard silver 
And as for gold, they will not delight in it. Also their boughs will dash their young men to pieces, and they will have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eye will not spare children, and Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, it will never be inhabited. Nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there, but wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The hyenas will howl in their citadels, and jackals in their pleasant palaces. A time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. So I repeat to you, this is historical. This happened to the Babylon of old, and it was total destruction um, of the Old Testament Babylon. And it has literally been uninhabited ever since. What God said would happen, happened. Now we're going to look at what will happen to the Babylon of the New Testament. So we've got a picture from the old of an actual city. Now whether there'll be a Babylon on earth, we don't know that really. Um, But that's not the point. It's, It's what it represents that's the point. And it represents an evil rule and terrible, terrible things that go on in our world. David Pawson again says, When we have one world government and one world religion on earth headed up by Antichrist, there will be a political and religious headquarters. There will have to be a center of government for the world dictator. Babylon is the name given to the greatest city of the future from which world government and world religion will radiate to every corner of the earth. Chapters 17 and 18 of Revelation describe the downfall of that great city in one hour. hour. All that it represents, we'll come to it, and you'll see that everything that man puts his trust in, his riches, his security, It only takes God one hour to bring it down. Again, Jesus' disciple John is given a vision. A terrible picture of a woman who's described as a harlot. That's what he sees. He sees sees her as a prostitute. And she's engaging with the world. And from our reading, we we saw in, in Revelation 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So I want you to try and grasp this, that we're talking about a a, a system, a world order, where anything goes now. This is headed up by uh, none less than the Antichrist. And we haven't time to go back into previous chapters where it describes what's happening on earth. But remember in chapter 16, as God starts to deal with the earth, that the the inhabitants of the earth are cursing him. They're not repenting. They're going through terrible things. Boils and the sea turn into blood and and earthquakes and hailstones of 100 pound coming. And they're still saying... We curse you, God. And and God, um, their very creator, is being cursed by those he created. So, John is perplexed by this woman. You have to realize, and we go back right to the beginning here, John is on an island. He's, he's he's, He's probably in his 90s now. He's a prisoner because of his testimony in the Word of God, and he's on Patmos, this island. 
And on the Lord's Day, as a visitation from Jesus himself, remember, he doesn't recognize Jesus, even though he'd, he'd spent three and a half years with Jesus, because now Jesus is in, in his glorified state. And John doesn't recognize, he falls to the floor, John. He's, he's, he's Jesus' friend. He's the one who, who Jesus, who, who, who calls himself the beloved disciple. He's the one who's, who rested his head on Jesus' uh, bosom on, on, the, on the Last Supper. And now he's with Jesus again on earth. Doesn't recognize him until Jesus speaks. Then he's, he, and the voice says to him, do not fear. And he's heard it. He heard it so many times when, on, when Jesus was with them. Uh, uh, you know, in human form, do not fear, do not fear. And he recognizes, my goodness, it's Jesus. Then he begins to get visions of, of the end times and he's told to write it down and he's transported, if you like, uh, to heaven and he, he sees the throne of God and he sees the, the elders and the worship that's going on and myriads of angels, 10,000 times 10,000 angels worshiping in heaven. He sees all this, and now he's, he's getting a picture of the very end now, how God has had enough, as it were, as the judgment of God is starting to come on the world system. And this world system is not innocent in any way. It is killing those whom Jesus loves. It's killing them as martyrs. And, and God is about to deal with it. He's about to show them just how strong they really are, and it's not very strong when they come up against him. So John is perplexed now, and he, he, he's taken up again to see this woman, this one who looks like a harlot. And he recognizes the animal that she's riding uh, as the beast, who we've seen in earlier chapters, of course, who we now know refers to the world dictator. So she is serving the, the antichrist, the world dictator, the beast is, is the way he's corrupting the uh, Sorry, she, the harlot, is the way he's corrupting the world. Fornication is mentioned, but it's in a broad spectrum of deceiving the world. And, and, and we know, you know, those of us who are older know um, how society is decaying, not fully, and thank God, you know, outside the church, there's lots of good people around it, but generally standards are decaying where anything goes now, where, that didn't when I was a kid, you know, the, where you, 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 there were standards and, and there were things, there, there were lines you didn't cross. Nowadays, anything goes, and that's going to grow and grow and grow, where, where every human being says, I want my rights, I want to be and do what I want to do. So, the beast and the harlot belong together, and the woman is Babylon this thing that's described as a city, which is really a world order. It's governing the world. It's a system that governs the world. People by now have had the mark of the beast, and you can't buy and you can't sell without uh, presenting the mark of the beast. To the ancient Jew, Babylon meant a cesspool of greed, of cruelty, of godlessness and lust. It's called the great city, not because of its location, but because of its influence. It is, I believe, the headquarters of the world order and system that governs rather than a set place on earth, though it could be in a set place on earth. It's much more than a location. People used to think it was Rome and associated with, with the Catholic Church because it mentions seven hills here, and there's seven hills in Rome. But that's not thought to be it. I don't think it is anyway. Uh, personally, I think it's, it's, it's even bigger than all of that by the end. So, Babylon's influence is described as that of a great prostitute. What was literal in Genesis 11 in Old Testament Babylon, Babel as it was then, is now a dark spiritual rule on earth. It's, it's mankind being sucked in by the evil one to, to, to see himself as his own God, to see himself as his master, that there is no God to worship. Do as you 
please. This beast and the rulers under him will attack the Lamb of God and his followers. But the Lamb will defeat them because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 14 says, These will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them. Alleluia. Our Jesus will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. We're on the right side, guys. To be able to label yourself as chosen by God, and you are, all of us in this room, the nine of us here, those watching. Why? How do we know that? Because the Scripture says God chose you, you didn't choose him. Isn't that wonderful, eh? And faithful. If you're walking with Jesus, you're on that side of it. Praise the Lord. We're born again. Whatever happens, and we'll come to that as we go on, that... Anyway, let me wait, because we'll come to it. You don't know what we're going to come to, do you? But anyway, we'll come to it. When we get there, I'll say, now we've come to it. (laughs) Verse 15 to 18 says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. Make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So in, in the final analysis here, in the final picture of this that we get in 17, the Antichrist who is acting under God now, doesn't know it, but God is affecting him to bring down the harlot. So the one who has used the harlot to govern the world is the one who now brings it down. He's about to get more than he bargained for. But <laughs> I, I mean, I've only just seen this, you know, where, however many times I've read it. I didn't realize... Listen again, for God has put it in their hearts. He's talking about the Antichrist now. He's talking about the beast, the Antichrist, all that, that kind of world government that's spiritual, that's evil, not people. And they are the ones who destroy what has been created on earth, this system, this world order. God uses them to do it. It's incredible. So God causes the beast to destroy Babylon. Now to a destruction. Hmm. Praise you. Jeb, I think I'll just stay and read rather than you coming back up. Is that all right? Revelation 18, verse 1 to 8. After these things I saw another angel, this is John speaking, coming down from heaven, heaven, having authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works, in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her, in the measures that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord. Strong is the Lord God who judges her. It's over. At this stage, it's over. How many, however many people on earth who don't belong to the Lord, who, who have benefited from this system, 
who it uses, obviously it's using a sexual terminology, but it's, it's, it's far more than that. It's just, it's just to say that people who've been drawn in to this system, people who've lived as they wanted to live because they could under this system. The end will be swift indeed. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of our torment, saying, woe, woe, or alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. One hour. That's all it's going to take. Everything that people have placed their trust in collapses before them. No matter how much money people have in a bank account, no matter how successful they are in life, no matter how much they're looking forward to the future, one hour and it's all over. Everything. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29 <clears throat> informs us now, not just then, but then as well, if you like, that we are receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken. Whatever's happening around us, whatever's happening on earth, if we are dwelling in that kingdom, then we will not be shaken, praise God. Verse 11, back to Revelation 18, And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Can you imagine the collapse of the world economy? Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, zinc and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. No more. Nobody will ever be sold as a slave again. You see, the system bought people, not just in this sense, but that's what I've just read at the end is that sense that the world system has enslaved people, still enslaves people. But people were bought by the system and deceived by it and drawn into it and, and their lust satisfied by the system. So they were happy to walk with the mark of the beast for a season, even though they'd been warned, even though at this stage God had sent an angel to preach the gospel, they still chose not to repent and follow Jesus. So, verse 14, the fruit that you so long for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her, the world system that is, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment weeping and wailing and saying, whoa, whoa, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Why would anybody choose that system above Jesus when that's going to happen to it? But they don't know that's going to happen to it, do they? You see, Scripture says this, naked we come into the world, naked we leave it. So this is apparent in every life. This is not just the end times. Everybody who dies outside of Christ comes to that point where, where whatever they had on earth is worth nothing. Nothing at all at the point of death. Whereas for us as believers, the end is just the beginning. The beginning of things that are far greater than, we've been, than it's been possible to imagine. For now we see not fully, but then we'll see, we'll see fully. So, we see here the absolute of the true worth of worldly things outside of God. It's not wrong to have things. It's not wrong to be blessed by God. I pray our whole congregation will be blessed in every sense. 
But it's outside of God, where these things are your God, where these things are the priority of people's lives, where people do anything, tread on anybody to get them. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Can you imagine? When you place your trust in what you've got, when you place your trust in your bank account, when you place your trust in your position in society, the title that you may carry, it, it's a horrific scene that's being painted here because people suddenly get a realization they've got nothing. There's a, there was a scheme in America. I'm trying to think of the guy's name, Bernie, Bernie Madoff. You probably haven't heard of him in the room here. And he had a, a patsy scheme, what they call that, where he, was, he didn't have what he said he had, and people were investing in it. People invested millions. He ser- he's serving like 150 years in prison, and he's about 80. Bernie Madoff. And he, he, um, one woman, when it all came out, and they realized that, horror that they put but it was greed in many cases because he said I can make this much out of that one woman said this in an interview when when he got caught and they realized it's a scam she said I went to bed last night as a multimillionaire. I woke up this morning with nothing can you imagine that's exactly what's going to be happening on earth at that time Retribution will be taking place as people lose their power, lose their positions. But we have received a kingdom. This is what I was coming to, and now I've come to it. (laughs) We have received a kingdom that has within it so much more than going to heaven when you die. We are not to cower down until we go to heaven. Cower down from the world. And, but rather we should rise in his name. Because we will not be shaken. Hallelujah. We've received a kingdom that can't be shaken. If you truly walk the walk as it were. If you stay close to Jesus. At times we absolutely need grace. Because we get it wrong and we fail and we sin. But I'm talking about an attitude of heart that picks itself up, that repents when necessary, that finds grace and goes on, then you will not be shaken. All around you may be shaken, you'll not be shaken. The kingdom consists of everything that exists in heaven that God has made available to his children on earth. And it's available now. Praise God. It's available now. It's not... When you get to heaven, you'll get this and you'll get that. It's available now. These unshakable things are given to us now on earth so that we, God's people, can live successfully on earth whatever era of history we may be living in. Whether it's now, the future, as it was in the past, and of course these things are to be lived out of your soul benefiting your everyday life. The kingdom is in our lives to benefit our everyday lives. It's not simply attending church or worshipping Jesus even, you know, as we do and I love to do. I'm, I'm a demonstrative person. I love to worship and praise physically. But it's relationships, welfare, health, So many things we list that are everyday lives that are benefits of the kingdom now despite what the evil one's seeking to do in the world. So God says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Take this tonight. If you you fear the future or this kind of stuff makes you wobble, God is not going to let his children suffer needlessly or perpetually. He is not. He's a father and he's a good father. Verse 17, it says, Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? 
They threw dust on their heads and they crowd out, weeping and wailing and saying, Whoa, whoa, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour, three times it says it, for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. You see, you know, <clears throat> people in power. In the movie Schindler's List, if you've ever seen it, it epitomizes the cruelty of the German commander, commander of the, the prison where the, the Jewish people are. He's, he just, he's so evil and so full of himself that he just for fun shoots people at random who are down working. He just gets up and stretches and his morning stretch and has a look and just pop. Eventually, that man faced trial. It was so horrific what happened to him because he was sentenced to death and they brought him out to hang him and they hung him, but it didn't work properly. So they took him down and took him in. So he's still awake and conscious even though they tried to hang him. They bring him out again, second time. They hang him. He still doesn't die. He's going through torment. Can you imagine? He's, going, he's conscious all this time. And, and again, they bring him down. They walk him back in the second time. It's only the third time that he dies. You see, I, why do I say that? Because there are those in parts of the world who persecute Christians and think they're never going to pay for it. They kill God's people. They've always killed God's people. And they think, oh, I got away with that. Maybe I'll do it again. God is watching. God is watching. He's an avenger. They, you do not hurt a child of God without severe consequence. But it's a cumulative. Consequence from God is a cumulative. And the, the reason is, he's a redemptive God. Even for those who've really done bad, he's still seeking to save people. He wants to save people. He did not create hell for people. It was for the, the devil that he created hell. And his cronies, of course. His desire is not to send people there. People choose to go there. Do you know why? why they choose to go there? Because they don't do what you have to do to escape. You don't go to hell because of what you've done. Sin was paid for. You go because of what you don't do. Because you don't accept a saviour. People choose to go. That's the truth of it. Big deal, isn't it? But it's true. So those who persecute the church and individual Christians, those who have done harm to God's people, do not escape judgment unless they turn to Jesus. Sin is always paid for. If we don't allow Jesus to pay for our sin, then we absolutely pay for it ourselves. It's always paid for. Thank God we have a Savior who paid for our sin. Verse 21, 24 says, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence this great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain on the earth. God strikes a lasting, terrible blow to those who have persecuted God, His church, to a system that's persecuted His church. It's destroyed completely in one hour. 
Most of us have seen the movie Taken. You guys seen Taken. Taken 1. I remember watching it and thinking, I'm not sure I should be so glad that he's hammering all these people. <laughs> but it's the sense of justice, isn't it? It's that, you know, you think, oh dear. I'm so, go on, you know, get him. <laughs> go on. Go on, Liam. Go on, Liam. And then you think, oh, should I be celebrating that he's hammering these people? But it's, it's vengeance, isn't it? It's, it's justice. It's, it's, it's what you believe is right. They, sh- they deserve it because of what they did. Well, this is what's happening here. They're getting what they deserved. The end. We're now getting close to the creation, as I said, of a new heaven and a new earth. Next coming up is a peep into chapter 19. And what is taking place as Babylon is destroyed on earth, this is what's taking place in heaven. We're going to look in detail next week, but here it is. John now has witnessed the harl at the destruction in one hour of the world system, all that's going on on earth. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. For true and righteous are his judgments. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servant shed by her. Again they said, Hallelujah. A smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders, they're here again, these 24 elders and the four living creatures. Guess what they're going to do? They fall down and they worship. They've been doing it right the way through Revelation. And they're still doing it. <laughs> and they worship God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah, justice has now happened. A world is about to be recreated, as it were, a new heaven, a new earth, where there'll be no injustice anymore, no pain, no sorrow, no death. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, And as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. If you're old enough, you remember a chorus with those words. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, his bride, has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're going there. Biggest party, best party you've ever imagined. It lasts for seven years. Oh yeah. We're invited, guys. Marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true saints of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. You can imagine John overawed now by this. Mighty angels interacting with him. Here in heaven and multitudes worshiping God. So he falls at the feet of this angel. But the angel says to him, See that you do not do. See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren who has the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then it comes. Bear with me a second. Revelation 19.10. Then John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Can you imagine John seeing Jesus again now? Jesus is on the horse. (laughs) Faithful and True. And now John's seeing everything he taught us when he was on earth. All that that he shared with us, the disciples, all that history. 
has thrown open the times when it appeared his church was beaten or defeated, when saints were being persecuted. Faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes war. This is Jesus. His eyes are like blazing fire. Why, why is it portraying him like this? Because he's coming for the devil. He's on his way. The devil's on earth now. Kicked out of the second heaven. He fell to the earth. He's on earth. He's, he's been governing the earth and the earth system. Jesus is coming for him. So his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. Listen to this. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. I love this because it shows us there's going to be animals in heaven. They're all, not, they're all on horses. And his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, which, which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. What's he got written? King of Kings. Imagine that. It's like super dry, isn't it? You know, you know what I mean? I've got some super dry. But on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. Some of the older folk haven't got a clue. It's just me <laughs> refusing to grow old. On his thigh and on his robe, he has this name written. I've always been fascinated by this. Because picture him. Jesus is like this. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. And he's on his way back to earth. And as the chapter goes on, we'll see next week anyway, he absolutely deals with the evil one. On his robe and on his thigh, our King Jesus has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wow. We're getting to the end, as I said, and it begins to get beautiful from here. We've, for weeks, <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, it's Debbie shouting hallelujah. <clears throat> for weeks we've been in, I've thought, as I've been studying it, oh my goodness, how do you teach this? It's terrible, isn't it? It's terrible stuff. How do you get a positive out of some of this stuff? Well, from now on, it starts to get very positive. As we see God's intention from the beginning. And, you know, <clears throat> if you're not thankful that you're saved, get thankful tonight. My goodness. It's the greatest prize you could ever get. Forget a career being better than it. Forget billions in the bank. That will count for nothing eventually. We wouldn't mind a bit of that, would we? Legitimately. Of course. But understand, you've got the pearl of great prize. Price. You've got the greatest thing any human being could ever get, and you've got it now by grace, and it's Jesus as your Savior. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus... We take no joy in what will happen to people, but we know, Lord, you're constantly reaching out to save people. Even in the worst times in the Great Tribulation, it's obvious as we've studied that you're still seeking to save people. You're still reaching out, and many come to you in that time. And we want to say from the bottom of our hearts, as we study this, that we are grateful. We are grateful that we are saved. We are grateful that we are born again. We are grateful that we belong to you. You are faithful and you are true. And we see that immense picture at the end, Lord. People think they're getting away with it. People curse you to your face. People use your name as a swear word. Not realizing just how mighty you are. And that at any moment you could have intervened. But the full complement of those to be saved will be saved. The final person to come into the kingdom will come in one day. And at that point, Lord, we see what you're about to do. 
with that name written on your robe and on your thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's hard to even get our minds to imagine that, but it's going to happen because not one word of this book is false. It's the truth. It's painting a picture. It's symbolic, a lot of it, in the sense of uh, we don't need to understand it, but we, we see clearly the outcome. That there is justice, that there is judgment, that those of us who are in Christ are safe from that that there is a new beginning, as it were, a new heaven, a new earth that we will enjoy for eternity. We lift you up, Jesus, our yeah, Savior, our Lord tonight, with a big, huge thank you from here at Newcastle Elam, that we are very grateful. Amen. The group are going to lead us, guys, in your own way, in your homes, if it's possible. Join in worship him. I'll come and end in a moment or so when we finish this. And... We worship Lord. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of war. They think you're like, but I heard the ten Dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. So you are, so you are, so you are, and I'm loved by you.
can't wait to see a full room here. Hallelujah, Just Jesus. Just respond into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Oh, Father. You're a good, good father. Faithful to the end. Lord, for all those who may have struggled and suffered with thinking, wondering why you didn't do something. Oh, Father. We see that eventually you do do something. Yeah. Against those who may have appeared to get away with what they have done to your people. And we realize, Lord, that a few moments in heaven, nothing that's been of difficulty or pain or struggle on earth will will ever again have any meaning, as it were, Mm. as we're totally liberated in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Wow. And it's it's our portion. As true as anything else will happen to us, that is going to happen. Thank you. And by faith, we take hold of it tonight and we salute you Mm. and uh, go back to those words again in Revelation 19 that John sees that you are referred to as faithful and true. He knew that already He spent time with you on earth. He was the beloved disciple, but he sees it in a fuller way. He was privileged to see it in a more unique way looking ahead to what is yet to come. So we salute you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We appreciate you very much. Yes, thank you, Lord. And thank you for one another. It's just so great to be with these guys tonight in the building, broadcasting from here again. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Just a heads up for Lewis and Yara and Sam. Yes, thank you, guys. guys. Very much appreciated. As it is for these guys, and we've had a chisanga tonight. Woo! You always know there's going to be an addition of demonstra- demonstrative behavior when they, uh, we yes. love it. Fantastic. <laughs> demonstrative praise, and you know what I'm saying there. Great stuff. Great. It, uh, it radiates. And guys, brilliant. Thanks, thanks again for your commitment. Tomorrow night, we are meeting here. And um, obviously, it's the first time we're meeting in a larger group tomorrow for those of you who are coming and if you have any doubts don't come I've said that to you if you feel you may have some symptoms don't come if you feel maybe it's too early for you please feel free not to come but for those who are coming we are not at liberty to be as we would want to be you know it's a bit easier with this number of people in this big space there's going to be more people here we're not liberty to just sit anywhere. You would appreciate that. Mm. It will be uh, stewarded where people sit. There'll be the obvious stuff of washing hands when we enter the building and, and leaving again. And things will be cleansed. There's a cleaning operation going on uh, tomorrow. And um, we will do all that we can do. We may not <laughs> want to. And there's certainly individuals who would probably be a lot more uh, lax, as it were, who, who would feel at liberty to just be as they would want to be, but we can't do that as a collective. So I ask That's you, right. from my heart, please come understanding that we're not at a level of liberty we would like to be at. So we won't be singing, for example, even though this number we can do it, we can't do it with the numbers that will be here tomorrow. And we, we, we cannot afford to be to look as though we're foolish. Faith is not foolishness. That's right. We can't afford to do it. So please, please follow guidelines. If we see something tomorrow, we think that needs correcting, I I will say it because the all is very important. How we act as an all group is very important. We're taking small steps. We want to keep taking steps forward now until we are at liberty. And believe you me, there won't be a moment (laughs) <laughs> it won't be a moment longer that we are not back in the fullness <laughs> of what we enjoy uh, once we can be. But we can. We're here tomorrow to pray. We're going to get results through our prayers Amen. tomorrow. We're going to see people, uh, some for the first time uh, in months. Uh, no hugging, please, tomorrow. You may have already started doing that in small numbers. I appreciate that. But in a larger number, again, we have to be careful. 
and uh, we will be careful um, not not because we fear anything but yeah. because of guidelines mm -hmm. that we're following and I repeat it's not just government guidelines we're following guidelines from our Elim headquarters as well and I have to be responsible I hope you appreciate that despite the fact that we all have different ideas about where we're at what we should do so there it is I think I've said enough on that but we can't wait to see you here we can't wait to pray together and um, uh, to get results you know we're not just gathering we're getting results amen our tomorrow. Yes. hallelujah Yes. So, God bless you. Mm. Thanks for tuning in again. And uh, actually, now we can say, it, at least to some, we will see you tomorrow. Not just you seeing us, we'll see you as well. So, God bless and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Good night. Every blessing from Bye. us to you.